and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I have made the promise that you promised me. You know, and this is the gospel. This is an unconditional promise. You know what they do immediately? They preach the gospel to people. They start a church, and then that church starts preaching the gospel. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. All right, here we're going to begin in Genesis chapter number 30, verse number 1. Just jump right into the chapter. Let's read here in verse number 1. The Bible says, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said, <clears throat> excuse me, and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Of course, in the preceding chapter, chapter number 29, we saw that Laban had beguiled Jacob. He ended up giving to him his uh, oldest daughter, which was Leah, which was not the original deal of why he was serving seven years. He was serving seven years for Rachel. And then the at the, that very night of the wedding day, um, you know, if you want to consider it the honeymoon, he, he uh, you know, went in under her. The very next morning, he finds out that it was not Rachel, it was actually Leah. So Laban had beguiled him. And he then uh, you know, uh, covenanted that he would stay another seven years. And he was staying th this seven years for Rachel this time. Uh, at the end of chapter number 29, we're told that Leah bore four children of Jacob, or for Jacob. They were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then of course Judah. Those four children all came from Leah. That's why it picks up here in verse number one. It says, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. So once he married Rachel, Rachel was not bearing. You know, he was married to both of them for a period of time concurrently, of course, and he continued to be, but he was, he was married to both of them. A period of time went by and Rachel was not bearing children. Only Leah was bearing children. She, she brought forth four children in this period of time. And you can see she's going to Jacob and she's saying to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Now obviously Jacob has no control over that. There's nothing that Jacob can do about it. It's a very messed up situation in the first place and, it, and, and the, whole, the, the circumstances should not be though the way that they are in the first place. Of course, I'm going to get into this in a moment, but uh, one major thing that we see here is the consequences of polygamy. The consequences of polygamy. Now that's something that we can't relate to very much in our society. Outside of the Mormons in the past, you know, uh, even couple hundred years, just the, uh, the past couple centuries really, no one really has practiced polygamy in the United States outside of the Mormons. Really. I mean, of course you can find people here and there, but on a mass scale, uh, uh, people that would, uh, um, you know, would claim Christianity or any type of religion, there's no one really that practices polygamy anymore. So you may feel like, hey, this isn't really relative to me or what can I learn from this. Just keep in mind that this was practiced for thousands of years and was very common throughout the Bible. Now, you don't, I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how, what area our culture is going to go in, but all parts of the Bible are good to learn from. You know, every angle, whether or not you feel like, hey, I don't think that I could ever experience that or I don't think that I could ever even know anyone who has experienced that. I can't think of any way in which it would be relative to me. You can learn from it. It's in the Bible. It records these conflicts and things like this for a reason. So, so we're going to get into that here in just a minute. I'm going to show you that the Bible clearly condemns polygamy. The Bible clearly tells you that the will of God is not for, for man and woman for them to, um, a man particularly, because that's normally the route that it goes, to have multiple wives. Either way, uh, uh, either way, God made man and woman. We'll see that in just a moment. Look at verse 2. It says this, And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, Am I in God's stead? So this made him angry. It says this, Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So he's, he's asking the question there, <coughs> Am I in God's stead? And then he's, he's following it up. Of course, a rhetorical question. Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? That's God. So we see that, that if you flip over, if we, or if you just look over, in the previous chapter, verse number 31, it told you, <coughs> and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. So who opens and closes the womb? God. 
So we can see that Jacob is well aware of this. He actually states, hey, am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld thee? Uh, withheld from thee the fruit of the womb. So Jacob is well aware that it is God's job. He is the one that controls whether or not someone is going to have children, whether or not they are or aren't going to be having children. Look at verse number 3 now. It says this, <coughs> And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. So she wants the, the child to be birthed in on her knees. Basically like that's the birthing stool if you will. The, the child is just going to be born there directly on her knees. Look at verse number 4. It says this, And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. Now, <coughs> oftentimes when you see something, a, a sin repeatedly, uh, repeatedly in the world that you live in today, you can become desensitized to it. Well, the same goes for when you're reading the Bible. Sometimes when you see them committing the same sin over and over again, you can become desensitized to it, to where you stop understanding really how sinful it is and how wicked it is. Now, number one, it was wicked in the first place for Jacob to take uh, his second wife. It was wicked for him to take on a secondary wife. That's, that's wrong. We're going to get into that in just a moment as far as Scripture. But right here, we see one more time... The same situation with, uh, with, with Abraham, really, where Sarah wasn't able to bear, was she? Well, the same thing is going on here. Rachel is not able to have a child. She's not able to bring forth a child. And what does she do? She goes and she gets her handmaid. She goes and she gets her servant. Well, what did Sarah do? The exact same thing, didn't she? She went and she got Hagar. Now, this also, uh, what comes into to play here, or what comes into a, a factor here, is, again, learning from others' mistakes. Try to learn from other people's mistakes and not to have to learn by just committing a mistake and then understanding, hey, uh, you know, I shouldn't have done that afterwards once you're already paying for the consequences. It's best to just look at the uh, other people as a good example or bad example. Follow the good examples. Follow the Bible, but also follow people in good examples. Maybe areas where the Bible doesn't exactly touch on those things, right? If you see that something doesn't work for someone, right? You're at a job, you're at work, you're putting something together, you say, hey, that didn't work. Then don't do it the same way he did it, right? You know, and then you see another guy come up and he does something correctly, do it the way that he did it. So we need to uh, follow the good examples, not follow the bad examples. We see here, same thing exactly that Abraham did with Sarah. That's exactly the same thing. And it was just as sinful to him to take on the third wife as it was for him to take on a second wife. It doesn't become less sinful. Like it's not like, oh, you know, it, there's no difference between bigamy and polygamy. Everybody know the difference between it's like bigamy is by its two wives, right? Polygamy is once you get really to like four and up. But it's sinful either way. You're not supposed to multiply wives. And uh, look, at, look at the following verse here. This is another thing we can learn from this. It says this in verse 4. One more time, we're going to read that and then verse 5 together. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. Verse 5. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Now I want you to notice in verse 4, or verse 3, uh, before, notice the way that Rachel words this. She says, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. Right? Then we look at verse 5, and it tells you, And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Now, I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist in the first place. But did Rachel really have children by Bilhah? There's no difference between whether or not it is Leah bearing the child, whether or not it is a maidservant bearing the child, whether or not it is Rachel bearing the child. Now, Bilhah bore these children uh, uh, you know, herself for Jacob, just like Leah was boring children, and just like uh, you know, we will see Rachel bearing children for Jacob as well. This, what, what comes to my mind here is uh, the concept of surrogacy, right? Like having a surrogate mother, father. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that someone should bear a child for someone else and then just give the child over. I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's ever taught in Scripture. You know, someone could try to point to Moses. You, you, you realize what was really going on in that situation, right? That's not what was happening. She wasn't carrying that child so that later on she could just give her child to someone else. She was saving Moses' life. So I don't believe in the concept of, of surrogacy. 
It's never taught in the Bible one time. The Bible talks about children being a blessing, as I've mentioned many times and showed the scriptures by that. Why would you hand over a blessing? If God's opening your womb, He's opening your womb for you to have a child. That's the whole reason why. It's, it's the fruit of your womb. It's your responsibility to raise your children. And that's what we see here is the concept of like surrogacy. But th this is not biblical. There's nowhere where this is found. We know that uh, the responsibility is always given to the mother and the father to raise the children. We look throughout the book of Proverbs and there are commandments to the father and the mother to raise the children properly and correctly. And in the word of the Lord. So that means that it's up to the father and the mother. Who are the father and the mother? The ones that brought them forth. That's, that's who. So this is, this is basically what's going on here. So even, even in the Bible's terms, did it end up being uh, Rachel's child? No, it's, it tells you very plainly in verse number 5, And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. Notice, this is still Bilhah's child. This was not Rachel's, Rachel's child. So it was, it was a silly thing in the first place. It was, very, um, uh, it was very petty, if you will. Now, keep reading here in verse number 6, because I'm going to get into uh, something I want to focus on here for a few minutes. It says in verse number 6, And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son, Therefore called she his name Dan. Verse 7, And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again, and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Nephtali. Now, <clears throat> I want you to, to understand here how infatuated they are with this fight between one another. That their children's names are literally given because of this argument or this controversy that is going on between these two women. Now, outside of what we're going to look at here in just a minute, which is a, a clear description of what God's will is for marriage, for, for man and wife, even just looking at this on the onset, does it appear practically to be a good idea to have multiple wives? Does it look like it's working out well? It's a, it's a total and absolute nightmare. You have these two women who are sisters that are married to the same man. One of them has four children, right? The other children just becomes just, just crazy. You know, she's losing her mind. Women are already crazy and they're even crazier. No, I'm just kidding. So she's like losing her mind and she goes to her husband, and this is, think of this, this is the one, you know, the, the one wife that he actually loves. The other wife, he has ze almost zero affection for. Th this wife is the one that he loves and cares about, and she's coming to him and saying, give me children lest I die. She, so she's just completely, obviously at this point, she's, she's depressed, she's losing her mind, she's, you know, she's just going, she's losing control, right? This is a big deal for her. You can tell that this is serious. She then goes so far as to give her handmaid. Say, hey, I want you to take my handmaid and have a child with my handmaid. That is sick and disgusting. Can you imagine that today? Put that in the context of today. What's, it's not any different, but when you're reading the Bible, like I said, sometimes you, you become desensitized because you see it happening so often. That's very weird. And why would she do something like that? Because she's so desperate. Do you know why? Because of envy of her sister having all these children. That's why. So, do you know what's going to happen if you took on another wife, men, which I'm sure you're not going to? It would, it would cause the two women to envy one another. It wouldn't work even practically, outside of even looking at a command. So if you were thinking about it, no, I'm just kidding. It wouldn't work. It's not, you know why? Because all of God's commandments... They are practical. They, yes, they are moral. It is, it is a sin to break God's commands, but the, He didn't put laws into place that just don't work in your life. All the laws, they will, they will inherently bring blessings. They are the right things to do in your life. God gives commands about your marriage and the way to live your life as far as your marriage goes of the man being the, the, the head of the household, you know, of, uh, of you know, uh, just all, all the areas of the roles of men and women. The men being the provider and going out to work, the women staying home and nurturing the children. He designed women differently than he did men. He did this because these are the practical positions that we're supposed to be in. Well, God designed man to be with one woman. He did not design this, this uh, ridiculous you know, uh, uh, scenario that we see here where one man has three wives. 
right now. And what's going on, even from a practical standpoint, it's a total and absolute nightmare. It's just constant fighting. Look at what it says afterwards <coughs> in verse, uh, verse 9. <coughs> Now, now Leah, watch. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. Why? It's just the fighting, just the envy, right? And then verse 10, And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. Now many people that will claim Christianity, you know, will say, hey, you know, the Bible allowed polygamy in the Old Testament. They'd say, hey, you know, it's wrong today, we shouldn't do it today. Or they would even ask the question, you know, uh, they may even be just be wondering, why did these people in the Old Testament uh, commit polygamy? And almost always when someone, both, the answer to both of those, almost always when someone wants to, to try to prove that maybe, you know, uh, polygamy was practiced or God allowed it, and, and it was okay to be in the Old Testament, they, all they do is they just point to examples. So if it's an atheist that's trying to mock the Bible, he'll just take you to examples in the Old Testament of people committing polygamy. If there's someone maybe that wanted to justify that they were in polygamy, do you know what they're going to do? They're going to point to examples of men committing polygamy. You can point to examples of people doing all types of wicked stuff. But that doesn't make it okay. What we go to is we go to teachings from God. We go to teachings from the Bible. We look at and see what God says, how we should live our lives, what we should do, and what are His commands. Go to Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 24. Genesis chapter number 2. This is when God created man and woman. <coughs> Genesis chapter number... Look at first, we'll look at Genesis chapter number 2, verse number... 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. So how many did he make? He made one, right? It's pretty simple. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. That is singular. And they shall be one flesh. Okay, so when Adam is created, go to Matthew. Go to the book of Matthew now. We're going to look at Matthew chapter number 19. So when Adam was created, <clears throat> God successively made a partner for Adam. And it was a woman. <clears throat> he did not make multiple women. He did not make multiple partners. He made one woman. Correct? So what was the will for the first man? What was God's will for the first man? If he wanted him, let's just God's will. When he just creates, this is just very on a very basic elementary level. If God willed that man would have multiple wives, he would have made multiple women there, wouldn't he have? I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It's because it is ridiculous. So he made one woman. And then we see Adam going on to explain that man, singular, you know, that he shall leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, singular. So it's a very clear statement that a man is supposed to cleave unto his wife, singular, right? It's very simple. That's because the, the subject is very simple. Go to Matthew chapter number 19, like I said. Matthew 19, we're going to begin reading it <coughs> in uh, verse number 1. It says this, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, <clears throat> Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, this is a question about divorce. But let me tell you this. These two subjects are almost identical. And I'm going to explain to you why in just a moment. So he, they asked the question at the end of verse 3, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they're saying, Is it lawful or is it right according to the law? that a man can put away or divorce his wife for any reason or for every cause. 
Verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. That's singular. Okay? And they, look at this, twain. Notice that word was not there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. So you learn a little bit here when you go to this passage. So what does it tell you? They twain, they two shall be one flesh. Does it say they three? Does it say they four? No, it does not. So what is the will of God? It really is this simple when it comes to the subject of polygamy. God, Jesus right now, God in the flesh, is teaching that the will of God is that a man and a woman, they twain, shall be one flesh. Amen. That is the you know, uh, um, template of marriage. That is the pattern of marriage that men and women should follow according to the Bible. That's Jesus' teaching. But not only that, further on, I want you to go down, uh, look at, uh, we'll just keep reading the very next verse. Verse number 6 now. <clears throat> Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. So notice the emphasis on the two, but they're one. What therefore God hath joined together, <coughs> let not man put asunder. Now that's a very powerful statement, even in the concept of uh, just divorce in general. Notice what he said. What therefore God, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So who joined this together? This is God's will. Man and woman, they twain, one, two. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So he would, he's, he's teaching in the concept of divorce as well. He's teaching that this would be man you know, uh, stepping in and he, he would be out of his bounds basically, right? This is God's area. God is the one that brought them together. It's God's will that one man and one woman would be together. They would be married, and he said, let not man put asunder. So, divorce is not allowable. That would be man put, d dividing or trying to separate what God has brought together. Let not man put asunder. So, it should never be allowable. Amen. Let not man put asunder. I mean, that's powerful right there. Look at the very next uh, verse, though, because this is what I want to get into. They say unto him, why did Moses then... <coughs> Command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. Verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife. I want you to notice one other thing too. Verse 8. When he says wives there, I've heard this argument before because I've looked up like uh, 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 Mormons trying to argue against this. Where it says wives, he, you need to learn the language of the King James Bible. Mormons, because he's speaking in plurality. If you look throughout here, he says you, suffered you. He's speaking to multiple people. So he's talking about all of your wives, the, the group that he's speaking to. Not like your wives, Russell. You know, He's saying like, if I was speaking to everyone here, you know, God suffered you to put away your wives. That's what he's saying. Not like put away in your wives, like speaking to one person. That's a ridiculous argument. It shows their foolishness and their, their lack of understanding when it comes to the Bible. Amen. Because if you look at the very next verse, look at verse number 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, what's he doing now? He's speaking, to, he's speaking in general about a singular person now. Now he's, he's actually giving you a scenario is what, he do, is what he's doing. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now, <clears throat> the reason why <coughs> you are committing adultery with the second woman is because you are married to the first woman still. Do you understand that concept? Does everyone understand what adultery is, right? I'm sure. It's a very simple concept. If you're married and you go outside of that marriage, you've committed adultery. Let's say that you're married and you don't get a divorce. You sleep with another woman, you've committed adultery. Okay? So, I want you to understand this as well on top of that. If a person tries to divorce their wife, and, it's, and let's say it's not for fornication. It's not that the woman had committed a fornication and she's not a damsel or she's not a virgin, right? They divorce their wife after five to ten years. And they go 
and they sleep with another woman, even marrying another woman and, and you know, uh, going in under her, what does the Bible say that you just did? You committed adultery. That's what, look at what it says. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. So this is a person that divorced his wife for any reason other than fornication. And shall marry another. So even if you married this other woman, it says this. Committeth adultery. What is the definition of adultery? It is breaking the vow or going outside of marriage. So what's the point? You're still married to the first woman, my friend. That's the point. God is not disallowing your marriage. The definition of adultery is going outside of your marriage. So in order for you to be committing adultery, that means that you're still married. Okay? So think of that in the idea of polygamy. If, if when you put her away, it didn't really happen. It's everyone following right now, right? Like it's the guy who 10 years went by. Let's use the first scenario, very slow. He has a wife. <clears throat> he is married for 10 years and he's just sick of his wife. He puts her away. He goes and he marries another woman. Okay? He uh, you know, goes in under that woman. What does God say that he did? He committed adultery. Why? What is adultery? Going outside of marriage. So what does that mean? He's still married to that woman. That's the point. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? God does not, uh, uh, that is not a legitimate reason, so God does not recognize that divorce. That's what's going on. That's why it is adultery. So think about it now in the concept of polygamy. It's basically the exact same thing. You, you, you're just keeping the wife and you're not even writing the bill of divorcement. That woman is there, that same man, that same woman, he's not, let's say he's sick of her, but she just stays in the house. Leah just stays in the house. He goes and gets another wife, Rachel, and he goes in under her. Do you know what he just did? He committed adultery. It's the, ex it's the exact same thing. When a person is divorcing their wife, when they're, when they're divorcing their wife and then they're taking on uh, you know, uh, another wife, God is not recognizing that first divorce is what's happening. That's why he's committing adultery. That's what the definition of adultery is. So in, in, from one perspective or from one angle, it's almost identical to just taking on two wives. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's almost identical to the idea of that you've taken on two wives at this moment because that's why it, you are committing adultery when you, when you marry another and go in under the other woman. So it's the exact same concept. When, you're, when, you are, uh, per, when a person believes that there is no exceptions to divorce outside of fornication, you are teaching the, you are, you are uh, without knowing it, also preaching against polygamy is what you are doing because it's the exact same concept. The reason why it would be adultery is because, go back to Genesis chapter number 30. The reason why it would be adultery is because God still recognizes the first marriage in a sense. And then you have broken that vow at that point is what's happened and, and committed adultery against that first woman. That's why. The definition of adultery always, every single time, no exceptions is going outside of marriage. So if God says you marry another, you're committing adultery against the first woman, it further proves in that passage alone, which is about divorce, that polygamy is also wrong. It is adultery. You know what, you know what Jacob's doing? <clears throat> he's committing adultery on basically three women, basically is what he's doing. He committed adultery on, you, could, you would at least say, Obviously, you know, well, yes, that would, be, that would still be true. He's committing it. He took on the first wife, which would be Leah. And then he takes on Rachel after that. That's adultery. He committed adultery there. Then he goes ahead and takes on, uh, what was the very next one? Was uh, Bilhah, right? Or was it Zilpah? It was Bilhah, I believe. And then afterwards takes on the fourth handmaid. Or the, the second handmaid, which was the fourth wife. So you know what he did? He committed adultery three times on his first wife. That's what he did. 
That's wicked, man. That's super wicked. Don't overlook all these major sins of these people. It's a big deal. You need to understand the character and the nature of man. Oftentimes we read and we think of Jacob. He's the nation of Israel, right? He started Israel. He is Israel. He's the beginner or the progenitor of all of you know, what were God's people. Yeah, but man is wicked. When you read in the stories, pay attention to the lives that they're living and the decisions that they're making. And don't be a respecter of persons. Oftentimes people can kind of just read over things and not realize they take it out of context. And they don't realize just how sinful and wicked what they're doing is. And Jacob, like I mentioned, uh, I believe uh, either last week or the week before, Jacob was a very wicked man. He did a lot of evil things. He truly did. That's a good word to describe him. He was a very wicked man in a lot of different ways. Keep reading. We're going to see that in this passage again. We'll see him do something else deceitful as well. Keep reading there in verse number... Uh, <coughs> Uh, did we read verse 12? We'll read verse 12 again if we did. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. Verse 14, And, Rubo, and Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Verse 15, And she said unto her, is it, a, is it a small matter that thou hast taken my, my, my husband? And wouldest thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. So does it seem like they're getting along? Never. It's just like constant fighting, constant chaos, constant arguing with one another. You see... <coughs> You kind of see the attitude of Rachel where you can, you can see maybe her being, the, like it, it talks about her being well-favored, you know, her, her uh, 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 you know, being pretty or, or uh, well to look upon. You can see that in verse number 14 where she's probably just a person that's used to getting her way. Leah has these mandrakes and Rachel just goes to her and says, I pray thee, he, she says, give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. She's like, hey, let me have those. You know, she's probably just used to getting everything in her life. And what's the reason why? Because she's worried that Leah is going to use these mandrakes uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to use as a hire, as, as she puts it, to you, here in just a moment, to use as a hire to get Jacob to come in under her. And look at, verse, uh, look at verse number 16. It says this, And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me, <coughs> for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. Now this kind of shows you the relationship that Leah and uh, Jacob have. So does it look like that Jacob is just uh, lying with Leah on a regular basis? No, it does not. And uh, you know this is why we see uh, Leah when she's naming her children. She, she says uh, about, um, I believe it was uh, Simeon. The Lord hath heard that I was hated. He hath therefore given me this son also. So she's, she names her child because she has such anguish and, and sorrow about being hated. She names her child after that. I mean, that's obviously extremely sad. And it's to the point now where the only reason why Jacob is, is even lying with her is because he, she, he, she is giving him something to bribe him, basically. And that... You know, uh, you know, causes him to go and lay with her. So you see the terrible relationship, obviously, that Jacob has with Leah. It makes you feel, you know, bad for her, of course, as I mentioned in the last chapter. It's very sad. Look at verse 17. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my, to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. You still see what's going on here? What does dwell mean? It means like to live, right? So what is, what is this? It, this, could, this could mean two things. Number one, it could mean that they maybe are not even, even sleeping in the same room. Maybe they're not even staying in the same tent. Or it could just mean that sh he's not spending time with her at all. And he's just, she's just saying, now he'll dwell with me. He'll be around me. He'll spend time with me. So either way, there's, it's still either way very sad. Obviously the reason why they would not be in the same tent or, or in the same room is because in general he's not dwelling with her. He's not staying around her or wanting to be around her. You know, just from reading it, if he's sleeping in the room with one of the two, where do you think he'd be? Of course with Rachel. 
And Leah is just, uh, basically her life is consumed with trying to get her, her uh, husband's affection. Her life is consumed with trying to get Jacob to love her and to care about her. <clears throat> She's taking things and bribing her husband. This is, what we see in this entire chapter is the, the, uh, the result of polygamy is really what you see. You know, like I said, you may just think, hey, no one does that today. People did it for thousands of years. It, thousands and thousands of years and people all throughout the Bible uh, committed polygamy. You know, so it's worth to at least understand people today are even still proponents of it in the United States of America. There are even in still small areas uh, uh, that are governed under, uh, under different laws uh, in commonwealths. There are still people in the United States of America that live in polygamous relationships that are in like commonwealths and small cities and stuff like that. It's still practiced my friend and they would argue with you tooth and nail that this is a biblical practice and let me explain to you why you know it works for me and it works for my 15 wives. It doesn't work. We have an example right here of a polygamous relationship and this entire chapter is devoted to why it just doesn't work. The result of polygamy is what we see here in the beginning of this chapter. Look at verse number <clears throat> uh, look at verse number 21 there. And afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah. Verse 22, and God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. So, you know, here we see that God obviously loves Rachel as well. God cares about Rachel as well. God loves everyone, of course. Verse 23, And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Verse 25, And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go. For thou knowest my service which, which I have done thee. Verse 27, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And that is, of course, the blessing that his father gave unto him. It's exactly what we see and what Laban is referring to. Uh, in this case, of course, there was many physical blessings that were given him from his father Isaac. And this is a very similar situation with uh, even uh, Joseph was blessed. And, and uh, we see that uh, Pharaoh and, and those in Egypt at that time were also blessed as a result of that. Look, in, uh, look at verse number 28. <clears throat> and he said, Appoint me thy wages and I will give it. So Laban tells him, hey, tell me you know, what I owe you and I'll give it to you. I'll square up with you and, and uh, you can leave. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it, it was little which thou hast before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now when shall I provide for mine own house also? So he's, he's basically saying that I've been just laboring and slaving away for you and everything that I'm doing, all the work that I'm doing is basically just going back in your pocketbook. All the, the labor that I'm doing, I'm not really being able to uh, you know, take part in it or to enjoy it in any way. I'm laboring and you're basically taking and, and enjoying all the blessings of it, right? <clears throat> he says after that verse number um, 31, and he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats. And of such shall be my hire. So when he's referring to the cattle there, <coughs> it defines for you the sheep, and the goats, right? And then he starts mentioning the spotted, he starts mentioning uh, you know, the speckled, and also the brown. They consider these deficiencies, is what they're referring to. You'll see that here in just a moment. Look at verse 33. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come. 
When it shall come for my hire. Now hire is like wages. Ver, keep reading. Before thy face. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. So he's saying is, I'm going to go through all of the, the sheep and the goats, all of the cattle. That's what he had. Of the cattle, it, it is sheep and goats. I'm going to go through all of them, and I'm going, to, I'm going to find any of them that have spots, or that are speckled, or that are brown. It's grizzled is also it's referred to as. And they are taken, and they are put aside into like a separate flock, right? They're going to be set aside. They're going to separate those. And Jacob, and, uh, uh, yeah, Jacob yes, is saying, those are going to be mine. And then I'm going to leave all the other ones for you. So basically what he would be doing here is, is he, he's saying, you know, all of the, the spotted and the speckled, which they would say is, is, of course, going to be, there's going to be a lot less of them. But also, all throughout the Bible, you know, uh, when you see uh, God describing the, the sheep and things like that, when he talks about the spots and the speckles and, and uh, the grizzled, He'll often refer to it in the sense of it being like a deficiency. He'll often talk about it of it being like it's uh, like it's a problem, like it's some sort of issue. So it would be as if almost he's taking the weaker ones as well. But not only that, he's going to be getting the less. Because how many of them have deficiencies? Obviously, there's not going to be as many that have problems, right? How many of them have spots and speckled and are grizzled? Not as many, right? So he, it looks like he's going to be taking way less than Laban. So Laban's like, he ends up telling him, you know, basically it's a deal. He says at the end, verse 33, Jacob that is, he says, that shall be counted stolen with me. So he's saying if there's anything other than that, other than the speckled, the spotted, if you find it with me, consider it that I stole it. It would be like I stole it. So I'm not going to keep any of those. Verse 34, and Laban said, behold, I would it might be according to thy word. Would is like will, but it's talking about like what he wants, right? Uh, used in a little bit of a different way as we would. Verse 35, and he removed that day the he goats that were ring straked and spotted. Ring straked just talking about like a ring around them, right? And spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and everyone that had some white in it. And all the brown among the sheep, among the sheep, I'm sorry, and gave sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Verse 36. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Verse 37. Look at what Jacob does. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar, and of the ha and of the hazel and chestnut tree, and peeled, and that's like our word peeled today and peeled white strakes in them. That's like stripes. That's what strakes is. In them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. Now, who thinks that this sounds like a good idea, like scientifically? Or does it sound kind of ridiculous? It sounds ridiculous. Now, I've heard people say that maybe it's like he knew something about uh, um, how this is going to work medicinally. That maybe there's some sort of like medicinal aspect of these, uh, you know, of the chestnut tree when he's ripping the bark off, that maybe it gives like some sort of effect to them. When we read here in verse number, um, verse number, where did we leave off exactly? Verse 38. If we read in verse 39, it says this, and the, flat, and the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring strakes, speckled, and spotted. So it sounded like it worked, right? That's what it sounded like happened. Well, I personally do not believe that it was because of Jacob. I think... And, and, and maybe, hey, I could be wrong, of course. I'm wrong all the time. That maybe it was uh, some sort of medicinal aspect. But I'll show you why I don't believe that. Because if you look over in verse number 8 of the next chapter, <clears throat> this is Jacob speaking unto his wives. It says this, if he, if he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straked, ring straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. Verse 9, Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Now who does Jacob think did this? God did it. Right? 
Further proof of that is the next verse. Verse 10, And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. Verse 11, And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see. All the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. Watch this. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. Who did it? God did it. He's saying, as a result of what Laban did, I have seen, he's saying, I am recompensing you. Now, of course, he used the method that Jacob was attempting to use. And Jacob is even aware here, <coughs> if you look up at verse 9, it says, Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. So Jacob is even aware that this was a work of God in the first place. He gives Jacob a dream, and in the dream, all, all of them changed to speckled and ring-straked and spotted. And then God tells him, hey, lift up your eyes and look. What's the implication there? Look at what I did, is what he's saying. He's the one that caused this. He said, lift up your eyes and look. And then he says, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. So why is he telling him he saw what Laban did unto him? Because if you look up at verse 7, you know, uh, Jacob says, And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. So God is aware of what Laban did to him. He wrongfully treated him. So what did God do? God obviously caused the, them to conceive and to bring forth ring strength. That's the purpose of the dream. You know, I believe that's super clear. Look at verse number 40 over in the uh, chapter that we're in right now, chapter number 30. It says, And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straked, and all the brown in the flock of Laban, and he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. Now, I always try to find some sort of application. Of course, the, the Bible says in the volume of the book, it is, writ it is written of me. Who is that speaking? Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Who is the seed of Abraham? It is Jesus, right? Oftentimes, the seed of Abraham is referred to as what? Israel. Who is that? It's Jacob, of course, right? So we would expect Jacob or Israel to be a great picture of Christ, right? Of course. Well, here, what you have is you have the, the seed of Abraham. You have him separating the flocks. And what did he call them? He called them the lambs and the goats. Isn't that interesting? And, of course, you have some of them that are spotted. And you could say that that is, what does spots oftentimes represent in the Bible? Sin. And which ones are going with him? The ones that have the sin, right? You could say those are the sinners that admit that they've sinned, right? You know, J Jesus talked about how, uh, you know, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And, uh, you know, I have a different interpretation than the majority of people about that because all are sinners. You know, and, and in context of one of those times, it's quoted three times, one of them you can prove the interpretation of that, where it's actually talking about those that will just admit they're a sinner. It's like the man that goes down to pray, right? And he lifts, and one man won't lift up his head even to, to, to pray to God, while the other Pharisee is over there, and he's you know, uh, justifying himself and saying bad things about the other man. And then the other man is referred to as what? He, he, he talks about himself being a sinner. What is he, how does he word it exactly? What's the statement that he makes? What did you say? Lord be to me. Yeah, Lord be merciful to me, a sinner. And it says he won't even lift up his, his head to pray. That's exactly what he says. I knew he said sinner in the prayer, right? Lord be merciful to me, a, a, a sinner. So that's what I believe the spotted represent. What did, who did he come to save? He came, you know, he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All, and and, and further, a further point of that is, uh, in context... You know what he's talking about when he says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance? It's the Pharisees. It's the Jews that are talking to Jesus. And he's like, why are you with all of them? Talking about like Mary Magdalene, you know, all of the, the prostitutes, the publicans. And he tells them, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right? When Jesus is, uh, when Jesus, go to Matthew 25 and we'll look at this. This is very interesting. When Jesus is telling a, a parable in Matthew chapter number 25, he talks about when he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. <clears throat> Matthew 
he talks about a time when he's going to sh separate the, the sheep and the goats. And he says in <coughs> verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. It says, And before Him shall be gathered all nations. Now notice that. All nations are going to be gathered here. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and it says, but the goats on the left. So go back there to, to Genesis chapter number 30. So notice we have an exact uh, parable that Jesus tells about himself, where he, who is the seed of Abraham, he is going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? And then here, who do we have? We have the seed of Abraham. What's he doing? He's separating the sheep and the goats. Of course, uh, some of the sheep and some of the goats are going here, some of the sheep and some of the goats are going here, but he's keeping the spotted ones. Because he came to, uh, he, he, like I quoted a, a moment ago, he came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The spots would be representing uh, those that were uh, uh, sinners, those that he came to redeem. He came to, for the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look at what it says next there in Genesis chapter number 30. Uh, verse number 41, And it came to pass... Whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, <coughs> he put them not in, so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and maid servants, and men servants, and camels, and asses. So it ends right there just speaking to you and telling you about uh, the blessing. So basically what you're seeing right there at the very end, that is the blessing that was given to him by Isaac. Those were the exact things that he talked about. He talked about him being blessed by basically agriculture. He talked about the corn and the wine, the things of the field, right? He was blessing him with all things of the earth, that the earth was going to bring forth basically abundantly for him and always going to bless him um, um, in, in uh, the sense of food and possessions and things along those lines. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for uh, uh, the book of Genesis. We thank you for...